Okay, well, welcome everybody. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Ken Dill for uh, today's Zoominar. Ken is uh, currently the Louis and Beatrice Lawfer Endowed Chair of Physical and Quantitative Biology at Stony Brooks University. Um, he has received a number of awards, uh, most recently the Joseph O. Hilschfelder Prize in Theoretical Chemistry and the Sackler Prize um, in Biophysics. Um, we all know Ken in this audience, um, but what he's best known for is his incredible contributions to the field of computational biophysics. He's really revolutionized our understanding of protein folding and protein association, which is what he's going to talk to us about today. And I have to note as well that he wrote a phenomenal textbook. And I know that many of us in the audience have used it in our classrooms, both for a standard statistical mechanics and also for a biophysics class. Um, Ken is a phenomenal lecturer, and I am really excited to hear your lecture, Ken. So Ken, we'll let you speak uninterrupted. And at the end, uh, I will host the questions. Thank you so much, Joan. Uh, let's see, everybody sees the slides okay? Yep. Looks good. Okay. Okay. Terrific. Um, I hope I aimed this at the right audience. Uh, I'm not sure I did, but let me give this a shot. What I want to tell you about is some work we've been doing the last couple of years on uh, trying to develop models for protein association aggregation and so on. And we want to do this from the point of view of physical forces as opposed to things like machine learning, for example see if we can make predictive models. Um, and so let me just start with why do we care? Uh, what does it matter? How to control them? So three big things I think uh, are places where these kinds of tools might be useful. One is for formulating biological drugs uh, like antibodies. So we have a collaboration with Regeneron and we've worked with some other comp uh, companies too, looking at uh, th these days they, the biopharma world uh, isn't so much worried about uh, side effects of small molecules in the in the bio in the biological drugs area as they are worried about formulations. They have big formulations departments, and that seems to be one of their principal issues. And the formulations business is all about uh, keeping molecules folded and keeping them stable against aggregation, and also keeping them. To, to have low viscosity because uh, you have to inject them and you don't want to inject tar in your veins and uh, you don't get much compliance if you do. So the question is how to formulate biologicals like antibodies and so on. Second is proteinopathies. Um, I will say just a word about that. In fact, the word I'm going to say is about uh, some work that Jeremy Schmidt did a few years ago. And also these days in um, a popular hot topic area is membraneless organelles in which we are not working at all, but one of uh, my uh, former postdocs now uh, at now at Rutgers is uh, Greg Dignan. I'll talk a little about his work, and he is working quite a bit in that area. Um, so the purpose of modeling, as, as everybody here knows, uh, as again, again, I didn't quite know what the audience was going to be, but anyway, general introduction here. What you want to do, what we wanted to do, was to see if we could predict macro properties of protein aggregates from the microscale, from protein structure. Picture on the right is showing, let's see, I you can see my cursor, I guess, maybe. Does that work? Yep. Everybody? Yep. Okay, cool. Um, the green things at the top are uh, proteins, and uh, the idea is you, if you had a dilute solution of them, and then the blue dots and the uh, red dots are excipients and salts and pH and, uh, and protons and so on, uh, things of that type, ligands, and that these molecules can aggregate in various forms. One is on the left would be some native or also IDP type aggregation, and maybe some excipients are inside it, maybe not. And then there's also fibrils, and of course, you all know lots of other kinds of aggregates as well. And the, but the issue here from a computational point of view is what are those aggregation states or association states? What pro protein concentrations do they occur? What are the effects of sequence and structure of the proteins that are in, involved? What are the formation rates of them? And what are the effects of excipients? 
Now, let me just point out, um, it's it's a challenge to do this sort of structure function modeling, where by structure, I mean a, the individual protein structure. And by function, in this case, what I mean is association or aggregation states of the molecules. Going from protein structure to aggregation state is difficult. Um, the idea is what we want to do is we often need atomistic detail, but we also want to be able to get the macro scale properties of aggregation states. So MD simulations it, uh, happen to be one tool, and they've been very useful, and they're growing in power and are able to reach to uh, two proteins at a time and larger proteins than in the past and so on. It's a, it's a business that continues to push forward. But aggregates have many proteins, um, plus you have excipients, and you want to be able to study excipient concentrations, uh, different excipient concentrations if you want to design formulations, and you want to know protein concentrations. And a lot of these things mean uh, yet additional MD simulations. Then you're talking about whole NIH grants worth of graduate student time to do a lot of this stuff. A lot of binding modes, where are things binding? Uh, and if you model the microscopic, the detail level pretty well, it's often difficult to capture the macro properties. What are the viscosities of solution, different phases, the distributions of clusters, and so on. Statistical mechanical theories, in principle, were the way the field actually started, but you start by assuming proteins are spheres. And the question, and there's many, uh, I'll show you some examples where spheres isn't sufficient and you need to go beyond that. You need to know something more about protein structure, at least at the coarse grain level. Um, but SATMAC theories typically require symmetries of some kind so that you can do some averaging and that will speed things up from just a straight simulation. Um, also, it's they don't tend to be granular enough to treat protein sequence and structure. Um, they're not atomistic, so they're not particularly good for thinking about interventions like drug discovery. So the big picture macro scale observables from way back when um, that give some first the first level of course insights into interactions are the the leftmost picture here is showing that viscosity tends to go up non-linearly and steeper than linearly with protein concentration just indicating you're getting some kind of clustering beyond pairwise. Um, sometimes it is pairwise, and of course what you, and sometimes it's not uh, aggregating at all, but when you have high concentrations of protein, they do tend to aggregate. Electrostatics can matter. You can see that in salt dependencies, put in more salt. If you reduce the second virial coefficient, the B22, um, it's an indication that you're dealing with the monopole on the molecule. Sometimes for protein aggregates, you see just the opposite. You see salt uh, effects are to increase the B22 with higher salt, and that uh, can be an indication that you're dealing with dipolar, that the proteins have a dipole moment that matters. Oops. Sorry. Uh, my apologies. Okay, um, let's see, my screen here is flickering. I'm sorry about that. Let me try. Uh, okay, so, yep, yeah, sorry, let me try something else here. One second, see if this works. Uh, okay, let's see. Okay, uh, you're still seeing my screen okay? Sorry, I had no screen. No, you're, dis out. you're disconnected. You have to share your screen. We don't see anything. Okay. All right. <clears throat> 
That's good. How's that? That's good. All right. Sorry. Um, you typically tend to have these uh, temperature protein phase diagrams um, with a critical point at the top indicating you have uh, attractive interactions that are enthalpic, and then you have these uh, Hoffmeister effects, which indicates you have some hydrophobicity. But um, the question is how to how to rethink the modeling, how to build the modeling for, to be able to do this. Clearly, what you need is something that can. We want to get something that goes from the atomistic level or the structural level, where it does matter, all the way up to the macro scale level. So the notion here is obvious to I think everybody in this group is that you want to treat details only when they're where they're needed and not every detail everywhere. Use symmetries where you can, of course, that's uh, so that you can bring the step neck in and use the physics, uh, some kind of physics to bridge between the micro and the macro. And that's what I want to tell you is how what our strategies are for doing those things. So um, this is an example. This was work of Jeremy Schmidt a couple of years ago. And the basic idea here was to use uh, two symmetries. The question was, how do amyloid monomers form oligomers and fibrils? What would the phase diagram for that look like? Very simple model, but it seemed to capture pretty well um, the experimental data. Um, on the left is showing you a picture uh, in his paper in Biophysical Journal uh, about a decade ago, showing that the first step was monomers to sol soluble oligomers, and uh, these that these in the model uh, were much like uh, my cells. There was hydrophobic clustering, and so the entropy in the problem that was relevant for the that part of the transition was very micelle-like. It was about chains coming together with hydrophobic cores with some level of disorder. And then that there's a second entropy that goes from the uh, soluble oligomer stage to fibrils, and that entropy has to do with a, a chain registry, a lining up of the hydrogen bonds and a packing of the side chains. And those two entropies in a very simple coarse grain model were sufficient to give predictions of the type that are shown on the right-hand side, where you have a phase diagram that on the x-axis law of the concentration of the molecules, and then on the y-axis is showing you an interaction parameter. But the bottom line is you go from low concentration, you have mostly monomer and a high concentration. Depending on what that interaction parameter is, it tips the balance between the fibrils and the uh, soluble oligomers. And so we can calculate various distribution properties of fibril sizes and fi fibril length distribution, that sort of thing. Um, so this was one example of using the symmetries in the problem, making a very simple coarse grain model, and you can capture coarse properties. Now, what it doesn't do, and what we wanted to aim to do here, uh, is to be able to get the microscopic details in. Of course, the, there, there's an interaction energy that has to do with the hydrophobics coming together in the oligomers, and then an interaction energy that has to do with the hydrogen bonding in the second phase. Uh, so the basic idea here is very simple, and it is that just that uh, in a typical kind of aggregation problem, you, what you might do, what the sensible thing to do that most everybody here would think to do is, is simply to um, use your mi microscopic modeling, MD modeling, let's say, at a very local level to get interaction energies, and then to allow these kinds of symmetry-based entropies and steric entropies and so forth to be treated by some kind of solution theory or combinatorics. So, but, and to focus on that, to focus on the business of going from the uh, atomistic to the macro scale, um, here's a little background on thinking not about amyloid aggregation so much, but thinking rather about um, pairwise and triplet interactions that happen in uh, native state aggregation among proteins and happen a lot in antibodies, for example. So brief history is um, the 1990s were both uh, active in terms of theories and experiments. The theories were uh, very heavily around DLVO type theories where you assume you have that proteins are spheres, you assume they're charged, and so you just deal with like Coulomb or, or screen Coulomb interactions, and you assume there's some kind of a radial sticky function. People like Prausnitz and many others, Blachi and so on, uh, developed these kinds of models and looked at second variable coefficients and so on. 
experimentally, um, the liquid-liquid phase diagrams were being done by people like George Benedict, who has a, uh, some very well-known papers on lysozyme and crystallins um, back also in the 1990s. A nice insight came from a very well-known paper by George and Wilson in 1994, which showed that uh, you could predict some features of crystallization um, it, by looking at the second virial coefficient. The great part about this is it means if you know the pairwise interaction, you can scale it up to thinking about multi multi-body interactions. Um, this and this was not specifically on the subject of proteins, but it was gen a general result, colored result. Um, in the 2000s, um, people like Ted Randolph. Um, Carpenter, Vojko Vlachi, Steve Shire, those kinds of people were showing that protein stabilities also come in uh, to the aggregation properties. Um, Bruce Kerwin and uh, uh, Chris Roberts uh, in about uh, six or eight years ago were showing that aggregation also correlates with the second virial coefficient. And the nice news there is that what it means is um, since second virial coefficients are fairly modelable because they're they're small scale pairs of proteins, then you can scale up to to um, much bigger aggregates from there. So that was a nice hint that maybe we could do some factorizing. And then uh, some molecular structure was uh, brought into this with Jeremy Schmidt's model and um, Bruce Kerwin and Wang Zhu and other people and so forth. But still, I would say in by around 2015, uh, theories were still a bit limited. There was not a general unified theory that brought together viscosity, second virial coefficient, phase equilibria. The phase diagrams tended to be too narrow. The picture on the right is showing a picture of what you would get. The green is the thing you would get from a model. The red is the, what you would get from experimental data. You get these flat tops on phase diagrams that are flatter than a, a simple-minded uh, phase equilibria model would give you. And um, these were still, uh, the theories were focused around proteins as spheres at that time. Um, and they don't give you, allow you any detail for excipients and salts. And so um, this was kind of where we were about five or six years ago. Many groups are involved in this now, and uh, and various people have taken various steps forward. And I'm going to show you the ones that we, uh, how we think about this, and what we're, lessons we're trying to learn about modeling from all this. So when proteins are not spherical, um, the question is, what's the nature of phase diagrams and the macroscale properties and viscosities and so on? Um, entry, entropy can depend on shape and orientation and asymmetry. And then simple combinatoric arguments that come from the old days that of, stat, of simple stat mech uh, don't work, and you want to incorporate those features in some way. And so the approach we took is the so-called Wertheim theory. Now, this is a collaboration uh, with, between us and a group in Slovenia that was Vojko Vlachi was the head of it. Barbara Hribar Lee is now the head of it, and it's a group of five or six people who do both theory and experiments on protein aggregation of simple proteins and also a little bit on antibodies now. And so I want to just show you briefly that what the Wertheim theory is. It is, uh, this was, um, let's see, I thought I, I, sorry, I don't have the reference here. It's, it's, this is Michael Wertheim in about 1986, um, wrote down a theory that's relatively simple to apply. It's a diagrammatic expansion method. And uh, the basic idea is that you can use it for strongly associating structured liquids. The problem in standard um, liquid state theory is you often do expansions around monomers, then dimers, then trimers, and so forth. But uh, if you have strong associations, then you're going to get higher multimers, and you want you want something in which you have you can allow for orientation dependence. Um, where liquids are more complicated and where interactions are strong. So uh, this is the group at the bottom, uh, Miha Kostelik, Vojko Vlachi, and Barbara. And uh, they then in uh, 2015 uh, looked first at lysozyme as Apache sphere. So the idea is, okay, let's put the orientation dependence in, but we still have spherical symmetry. And we're able to um, show a flatter phase diagram 
closer to experimental data. Then um, crystallins are a little more dumbbell-like, and they were able to treat this also about the same time. And then I'm going to show you uh, a few results from this um, more of this sort of fancier, more complicated shape theory that was developed by them uh, and that we're still using. The idea here is that uh, you can model an antibody as a Y shape, and the way you can do this is through uh, letting seven beads assemble. So in effect, it's really a two-stage, uh, two, two level of, of energy that's involved here. The first level of energy is just getting, if you will, a sort of the equivalent co of covalent bonds to form, which is to say, I make these, you see these sites, they're colored, the orange and the green and, and blue and so on. Those sites are, are sticky. And the first thing you do is you just put the monomers in solution and then you crank down the equivalent of temperature, and then these things assemble into, into individual Y shapes. Now the individual Y shapes, so that's, that's really not the level that we care much about. It's just the sort of pre-stage where you assemble into individual molecules. Care, the stage we then care about is uh, one Y-shaped molecule interacting with other Y-shaped molecules. And so we call this a, a seven-bead Wertheim model. And what it does is it does all the combinatorics for you of figuring out, you know, if a Y, if one Y molecule has a certain interaction site with a certain interaction energy, then here's the combinatorics of the solution. Uh, it looks like this. Uh, there's actually, this is the only point, I guess, actually bottom line, the bottom panel is showing you how you compute stuff. It turns out it looks a little bit like binding polynomial theory. Um, and it, and it is that, but the top is showing you how we then compute. This is something that Jeremy spent some time thinking a lot about. Uh, how we then compute from these clusters. You get clusters, so the model gives you the clusters, sizes, P of N, uh, what the population is a function of the numbers of uh, monomers. In this case, uh, a Y, one Y molecule is a monomer, so N is the number of Ys. And then uh, to compute the viscosity, you, we use a, a simple expression of this type to tell you how do you get to viscosity once you know the cluster distribution. There's different ways to do this. This is an assumption. Uh, it's how we do it and, and it, at what we've found useful so far. So these are cases where the Slovenian group shows you here, Hennick egg white lysozyme phase diagram and you can capture now with the with the parameters the two parameters that come into this model are how many binding sites do i have so first of all you put in the symmetry of the object sphere dumbbell and so on um, how many binding sites do i have and what's the binding energy in each case forget the ones on the right this has to do with some salt dependence but that's sort of an empiricism that comes in at the end and then here's here's the diagram for the dumbbells the crystalline dumbbells so now on the left is just showing you a, a normal, more atomistically detailed picture of an antibody. And on the right is just showing you how they assemble in this Wertheim model when you're looking at uh, aggregation. So you can get dimers down at the bottom. You see the, a dimer here where some part on the Y shape of one molecule interacts with some part on the Y shape of another molecule. Um, or you can get whole chains of them if you have if you have a single interaction site on a antibody, uh, it dies at the level of dimers. You never get past that. On the other hand, if you have two interaction sites on an antibody, you can make linear chains. And then if you have three interaction sites, then you can make networks. And as you can imagine, the key distinction experimentally between them is the one interaction site gives you very little viscosity. The two interaction sites give you more viscosity. And the three is worst. And this shows you some predictions for some antibodies. Um, this is the gang, the Slovenian gang here. Uh, and then the data is at the bottom. This is showing you liquid phase equilibria of these, um, of these uh, antibody solutions versus temperature. With, that, with those uh, couple of parameters, you can do pretty well at fitting the data. These are showing you the viscosity curves nonlinearly increasing with uh, protein concentration. And um, the different curves here are just different salt concentrations, which I'm not really going to focus on here. 
main point is that the macroscale properties of viscosity on the one hand, liquid phase equilibria on the other hand, uh, you can capture with this um, with a couple of parameters in the Wertheim theory. So it does the Wertheim theory does the heavy lifting of the of the solution combinatorics, the stat mac of the for, for the solution, if you will. Um, still, it's a coarse grained model. It's not atomistic detail, of course. And also, it, what this do, model does for you is it gives you um, the cluster distribution. So on the right is showing you the two figures I just showed a second ago for two antibodies and showing you the viscosity as a function of uh, concentrate, the antibody concentration. And this is data, this data is taken from uh, Jay Aurora uh, and Charlie Tang and their group at Regeneron. Um, they did, they have collected together 10 uh, monoclonal antibody systems and they're doing some great experiments on these things. And Barbara and our group is doing the, some calculations to see how well this Wertheim theory can do on the left is showing you a sort of a more granular breakdown. So this particular protein, we just lay, we just called them antibody A, and the one on the bottom we called it antibody H. There's like I said, there's ten of them. <clears throat> and for this particular antibody, um, based on the the parameters that we use in the Wertheim theory to fit the viscosity on the right. It, we then get from the model um, the granularity of telling us what is the distribution of clusters. And what you see here is black curve is monomers, this purple curve is dimers. And you see even when you get out to way high con concentrations, you're still dealing with just monomers and dimers in solution. And so if you look at the viscosity numbers here, you just see the viscosities never get very high. This particular antibody just has something like a single interaction site and it never gets to be very viscous. This is a case, this antibody on the other hand is a little different. You see that it ends up with a very high viscosity and um, backing out from the Wertheim model, what, a, what does that give us in terms of clusters? Well, by the time you're out at high concentrations where the um, companies like to work, um, then you have three MERS, four MERS, five MERS mostly, and a few bigger ones than that. So we also looked at the kinetic mechanism of cluster initiation and growth, and this is really taken from Chris Roberts, some work that Chris Roberts and his group have done over the years. We can use the, prop, the parameters and the properties that we get from the Wertheim model to say something about the kinetic mechanism. So it's a simple assumption. Um, so the nucleation idea is suppose I have two antibodies. It's basically the idea that where the rate limit comes from, the slow step in the aggregation process is the, dime, the formation of the first uh, pairing in the first place. To, this is the initiation of the nucleation step. That's rate limiting in some cases. Uh, in other cases, it's elongation that's rate limiting. And so here's a case where I add a, mon uh, a monoclonal antibody to an, an existing pair, and then I extend the chain. And the question is, um, can I tell anything by looking at the static properties and the Wertheim theory? Can I back out anything about the dynamics of how it got there? Uh, and so we use this, uh, or Chris Roberts used this lumry iring theory, <clears throat> a very simple argument um, to, to be able to distinguish. And it looks something like this. Uh, it is, what it says is that, so as you start, when you start a reaction, almost everything is going to be just dimers. But the question is, as I go up in concentration, um, what is it, what is, what is the aggregation um, stoichiometry, if you will, look like? And the answer in the lumry iring theory is when this total molecular weight over the monomer molecular weight um, is nucleation limited, then what happens is you see this asymptotic approach to two, a value of two. So this is antibody A, this is weakly interacting. It's the one I showed you a minute ago. It doesn't have very high viscosities. And the point is this does seem to be nucleation limited by this, by this model. On the other hand, um, the um, indicator of being elongation limited uh, or growth limited is that ultimately for all concentrations, what happens is this ratio gets bigger and bigger. It's just that you're now seeing the limitations of three mers and four mers and five mers and whatever all 
<clears throat> and so this thing doesn't asymptote at two, which would be here, but rather it just grows with concentration. So we look at these um, 10 antibodies from Regeneron, and what you see is these particular ones, and again, I've, we just have labels on these things. We, I don't know, uh, Regeneron knows what these molecules are. I don't know what they are, um, but, but they give us labels. And so they, all of these ones are ones where elongation is limiting. These are ones that have high viscosities. You can see that over here. And these are ones that are nucleation limited. <clears throat> so we can say something about the, the mechanism. Um, this is a point that is known in the literature, and we just confirmed it with their, with the Regeneron antibodies, and that is that um, the key thing that I mentioned back in the history part, that second virial coefficient um, was raised to high status at, uh, in early days because it was predictive of um, multi-molecule interactions. So if you knew the pairwise interactions, you could say something about the aggregates and the association and the crystallization and so on. So, but the distinction here is whether to use the B22, the second virial coefficient, which, which um, is an integral over pairwise interactions, or to use the G22, which is an integral over the radial distribution function in solution. And the bottom line here is when we analyze the, these 10 antibodies, what you see is <clears throat> the G22 is very predictive of viscosity. No huge surprise here. Uh, solution properties ought to be the right thing to measure if you want to go from the dimer stage to aggregate stage. And, but the point is it's predictive, and the great thing for us um, in modeling is that the Wertheim theory gives you the G22. And so we, in this case, we can calculate from it the viscosities. And what you see here is the B22, and the color coding is indicating um, red region is indicating that these B B22s are negative, which says attractive, which any aggregation system is, versus showing some of these are repulsive and some of them are neutral. Anyway, long story short, the G22 uh, is the is is correlates with uh, viscosity and uh, is useful for predicting higher order structures. This is a point I made before. Um, just showing you that if I have a single sticky site, this one at the bottom, where I just have a single arm that binds, then my viscosity never gets very high with protein concentration. If I have two arm binders, then I can get linear chains, and then I get higher viscosity. And then if I have three arm binders, I can build networks, and the trouble is that gives me higher viscosity still. Um, what we're working on right now, and um, so this is sort of a progress report, is uh, protein association as a function of things like excipients and salts and pH. The um, Regeneron and, and the biopharma companies we talk to uh, have uh, an interest in figuring out what are the right excipients, both to stabilize the folded states of the proteins, but also to keep proteins from aggregating over long periods of time. They have complicated mixtures that are uh, individual amino acids, for example, are, are um, some excipients and some small sugars, uh, salts and pH and so on. They have to control all this stuff. What you would want in a model is some way of being able to put a dial on everything. So let's suppose I have some stabilizer. Um, I want to be able to ask as a function of the concentration of that thing, uh, what is the nature of the protein association in the presence of that particular excipient or that particular salt or a pH. And to put knobs on things is it's if you you can do molecular dynamic simulations, of course, in situations like this, um, but particularly when it starts getting complicated and you have multi components and multi multiple proteins, um, protein molecules, and then also protein concentration, then you need some way to, of trying to deal with this in a more effective um, modeling way. So we focus on the protein dimer interface and figure that if we can get that right, then uh, it will give us um, insights into the aggregation process. So the point is that it's the protein-protein interface we need to focus on, and that excipient uptake in that region is the place where we need to pay some attention. <clears throat> 
So when ligands are binding weakly, as they do for excipients and they do for salts and so on, these are weak binders are, are ones that don't have a specific tight binding site on the protein. These are ones that can populate lots of different binding sites. Then the assumption we make is that you can treat the binding sites as roughly equivalent. Um, you can expand that if you want. At the moment, I'm treating every binding site of an excipient, like uh, let's say glutamate is sometimes an excipient here. Um, and uh, so what I'm looking to do is to ask, um, where are the binding sites for glutamate? And then I'm going to, what I'm going to do is to estimate that from the size of the protein interface uh, and the nature of the protein interface, and I'm going to get an estimate of that, and then I'm going to use binding polynomial theory. Uh, so I also want to be able to factorize into equivalent proteins. I want to do a simulation on a single protein to be able to tell me something about the protein-protein interface. Right now I'm talking about sort of homoprotein modeling. Uh, uh, so we use MD for the microscopic details, the excipient. What is it doing? Where is it? What site does it like? What is its binding affinity? I'll show you this. And then we use the Wertheim theory for the macro scale. So here's our model. Um, we have a model we call the empty Oreo model and another one we call the Oreo model. Empty Oreo model is the top one. So protein is a gray thing. Uh, an identical protein is a gray thing. The red dots are the excipient. And when the, these molecules are isolated, the protein molecules are isolated and separated from each other, the excipients are sitting here occupying these binding sites. Then when the proteins come together and bind, in the empty Oreo model, what it does is it squeezes all the stuff out of the middle. On the other hand, in the Oreo model, what happens is when the proteins come together and bind, it doesn't squeeze everything out of the middle, but it does squeeze some stuff out of the middle. So on the one hand, um, what we need here is a combinatorics, and the, the combinatorics is of um, I have some binding sites for the excipient that are empty and some that are full. And what I need to do is sort of count all the ways that that can happen. It's very simple binding polynomial theory if all the sites are equivalent. So here you see the expansion of the first couple of terms of that. The first term is one down here. The first term is uh, I've got no excipient at all inside the protein-protein binding site. Second one is I have one excipient molecule for the n possible sites. This is counting up the ways that can happen and so on. I've got two sites full and so on. It's just the combinatorics of that. So basically the picture is very simple. What's in the denominator is asking the question of um, the two proteins individually. I have uh, the one here is indicating unbound. The second term is indicating bound. And then I have two times the total number of sites because I have the two, two um, sort of uh, bread parts of the Oreo cookie that I have to deal with. And so that's that's the count over everything, and then this is the count of how much stuff I have in the middle. So I have an Oreo model, I have an empty Oreo model. Do either one of these things help me figure out anything about excipients? That's the question. Um, so this is just showing the one thing that I do have to pay some attention to, and that is this is showing the binomial distribution of equivalent sites. If I have zero ligands in it, then this is the probability distribution curve for the various ways of distributing things. So zero is showing you empty the empty Oreo model. Green is showing you the one layer of stuff in an Oreo model. And the red is showing you this double stuff Oreo model. Now, first, how do we do this? So what we do is we use ClusPro. This is an algorithm by Dima Kosikoff here at um, the Laufer Center. Uh, which is a pretty good web server for figuring out if I figuring out protein interfaces. So you take two proteins, run close pro, it's a rigid docking thing. You can improve it some by adding our meld method, which is it, which now includes all the degrees of freedom. Uh, the picture on the right, I'm not going to go through this, but bottom line is just to show, first of all, that plus pro does a pretty good job already of docking. And secondly, that meld adds some value. So bottom line is we can often figure out, and these days, um, Dima in ClusPro is using um, the AlphaFold 2 algorithm for getting, uh, for getting a lot of the basic information of the individual proteins themselves. Um, in any case, the point is that this um, server he's got, ClusPro server, is pretty good at figuring out protein interfaces. So this is where we start. 
Second step after we know the interface is to ask, okay, so this is showing you a picture of a fab fragment. It's got uh, four pieces to it. It looks like two chains, but it's it's the four pieces of a fab fragment, the, the variable and constant regions. And it's showing you excipient. And uh, it's a molecular dynamics simulation replica exchange that just looks for where the binding sites are in the interface. It's in the region that we call the interface that we got from CLUSPRO. We now do a single protein study where we ask, okay, inside that region that we think is going to be the interface, what does the binding affinity look like at these excipients? Um, and what we get are these kinds of curves. This is um, done by Greg Dignan. And each curve here is showing you the binomial that we get by sampling all the different ligand bound states through the MD simulation run. And the three different color curves here are showing you different concentrations of excipient. So the pink has a higher concentration than the green and higher than red and so on. And we do this for arginine as an excipient, lysine, glutamate, and aspartate. Um, and from these binomial curves, we can now back out the quantities that we need from the MD, namely, uh, where are the binding sites, how many are there, and uh, what are their affinities. And these quantities up here are, are giving us that information. Now, what we find out is um, what we really want to do now is to map this onto asking, so how do these, uh, how do these excipients, when they bind at the protein-protein interface, how do they weaken the protein-protein interactions, and does it weaken it enough to capture what real experimental data shows? And the, the first approximation says, no, we're not capturing it at all. So this is uh, the MD simulation, the right answer. And this is, or sorry, the right answer is the experimental uh, binding affinity, if you will. But if I make the empty Oreo assumption uh, that everything, that all the ligands get squeezed out of the middle, then it turns out I overpredict by about a factor of three or so the sticking of protein to protein. <clears throat> so the empty Oreo model does not work here. However, it turns out if you walk your way up this binomial distribution curve, <clears throat> and instead of allowing zero ligands inside the proteins when they are bound, I instead allow anywhere from zero to one, or I allow anywhere from zero to two ligands to be bound inside the protein. Then it turns out what you see is if you allow the double stuff model, the Oreo model, which has extra stuff in the middle, uh, that model actually works quite well. And in principle, we could then allow or three or four or five and so forth. Uh, we haven't done that test yet, but it, what it should do is simply converge to this same answer. It, this, I think, is telling us that uh, a max of two ligands is sufficient. This is not adding any new parameters in any way to the modeling. We're just allowing up to some maximum number. And uh, the argument would be that number needs to be around two. That when I do that in this double stuff Oreo model, then what happens is the excipients that remain inside when the proteins do associate are sufficient. It's somewhere from zero to two molecules of ligand in between. That's sufficient to capture pretty well the association constant. Um, that we back out of the, from the viscosity data using the Wertheim theory. So we could, in principle, now we can run this whole thing forward, this whole machine forward, meaning here's what I would do. Uh, I have a protein-protein interaction I care about. I run ClusPro to find out the inter, where's the interface, what are the, what are the interface sites. I then run MD on one of those, one copy of the protein to find the binding affinity of my excipient with that site. Uh, I now use those numbers um, and plug them into the Wertheim theory, and now I can compute. Um, these would look like basically this, this is going to give me viscosity curves. What this is showing actually is that the protein-protein association weakens um, in order, in the following order of the type of excipient and also shows you how excipient concentration matters. So in principle, all of that's computable. In practice, all I'm showing you here is just a proof of principle, if you will. So uh, finally, my last point is that um, on the modeling side, um, the strategy we think for going towards these uh, protein associations and aggregates and the bigger clusterings uh, of proteins that 
the way to treat this is to parse to first of all to respect the aggregate symmetries and asymmetries the protein symmetries and asymmetries and use the stat mech where you can so the combinatorics where you have symmetries you use those symmetries uh, where you have asymmetries you can use the wertheim theory and the, that will capture for you the coarse features that will matter at macro scale for viscosities for cluster distributions uh, for phase equilibria, things like that. Um, so, but then where the, the parsing here is that we need the MD for the microscopics, for the details, for the binding sites, and for the excipient binding to the protein, or for the sticking sites where one protein sticks to another. Um, we need the MD to be able to give us the microscopic detail that's going to show us the sites and it's going to show us the affinities. And with that, we now can plug those into the macro scale model, like, like the Wertheim model. And then for weak binding sites for excipients, we just use these binding polynomials. And so far, it seems to work pretty well. Weak binding sites seem to be averageable in the sense that the different binding sites are all sort of roughly... Um, are fairly close to an average and you get a, a binomial like distribution and so that's a symmetry too that we want to exploit here and where possible really to ultimately make these uh, simulations and model efforts manageable you have to try to factorize wherever you can and the, from the multi-protein or the even the dimers uh, into single protein things Finally, thank, this is thanks to the group. Uh, Greg is the one who's uh, done most of the work I just mentioned, uh, and, and Barbara's group as well. And Miha is also one of the uh, Slovenians, and Jeremy Schmidt did the amyloid work I just mentioned. Um, and thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Ken, for a fantastic talk. So I'd like to invite um, the audience to type questions into the Q&A box. And um, we'll start with that, and then maybe later we can promote uh, promote people to live questions. And can you can look at the Q and A at the bottom, and I'm going to just read out the first question, uh, which okay. is from Rob Tico. Why is it good to have seven spheres in each Y-shaped antibody model rather than four or ten, for example, or one mm. sphere with three interaction sites? <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. Uh, we just picked seven because, first of all, we thought we could get a pretty good looking Y shape out of it. But I will tell you that uh, Tom Truscott in Texas also has done something similar to this recently. His is simulations as opposed to Wertheim theory. But what he did was to break the uh, antibody into 12 beads. Now, I think, you know, in principle, something like four beads uh, that was just suggested might well work very well. I don't know. We just sort of picked seven. Part of it was as a matter of kind of um, trying to do the Wertheim gymnastics and see how far we could push this. But I think actually the Wertheim theory in principle can handle much fancier than we're currently doing, including including what we could do now is not only have the multi-beads for each protein, but I think where time can also allow us the individual beads for excipients and solvent and things like that. Now, I think that's doable in principle. That that would be a direction we might try. So I don't know more than that. We tried seven. It seems to work reasonably well. Uh, maybe fewer would be okay. Thank you. So our next question, Jeremy, I'm going to get to you in a few minutes. I'm, I'm just going to through, go through the chat first. Uh, this is a question from Matthias Buck, and he asks, could you talk a little about hydrophobicity? Is water hydration of the protein-protein interface in a complex a key feature? Remembering that even Barney's bar star, a very tight complex, has extensive solvation between the proteins, i.e. is water an excipient? <laughs> Um, great question. We have not treated it that way. I don't know if we could improve what we do by treating it that way. Maybe we could. So far, we've just considered it background, if you will. So it's sort of an intrinsic reference state is the protein in water. And then um, in terms of the combinatorics of it, it should be in there. Uh, those interactions may be sufficiently weak that it might not matter, but I don't really know. Honestly, it, it's, it's something that's worth exploring. It's a, it's a Good, good question. <laughs> 
Thanks. Our next question is by Sudipta Maiti. And he asks, is there a simple way to understand the details of the effects of excipients? For example, I mean, in other words, why is lysine better than NaCl? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. And I don't have the, the answers to that. People like Charlie Brooks and other folks here on the call probably do because, you know, that's an MD question. It's an MD level question. And it's... Um, the details will matter there. Now, in terms of at the moment, we are just, uh, and the way I've, as I mentioned, the way we're running this machinery right now is kind of backwards. What we're saying is, okay, I know viscosity curves. I know the Wertheim theory. Therefore, here's the interaction parameter that makes the Wertheim theory work for the viscosity curves. And that's what I call my experimental interaction parameter. Then I run the thing the other way and I say, okay, now I'm gonna do a simulation. And the question is, what would it take to get that simulation to agree with that experimental data? Now, so that's the, le the only level at which we've done any structure function with excipients at all. It's, a, it's an MD person kind of question. Um, I, I'm pretty sure it's rationalizable by MD, but that's not where we've spent any time. I see Charlie has something to say. Well, I, I was just going to say, Ken, I mean, you are getting these interaction strength parameters out of this model. And, and, and what, what do you see, right. for example, lysine versus sodium chloride, as, as was just asked, or some of the other ones? Does it you know, map with what you would anticipate, I guess, in terms of the interaction strengths of those groups with the interfaces? So it's a good question, Charlie. Um, that we've not paid any attention to that yet. Uh, it is true. We have that all in our simulations, and it's a matter of just digging into them and asking that question. And we've not done that yet. We just where we the result I the last two slides I showed were two days ago. And so what we got to was the stage of being able to see, hey, look, this it actually agrees. That's cool. So now why does it agree? Don't know. That's uh, it's a great question. Thank you, Jeremy. All right, I've got two questions, and, and maybe I'll, I'll uh, pause in between if, if more come in from the audience. Right. Um, the first one, I, I, I think you might have answered this, but uh, I had in my head one model with respect to your Oreo models, and I think you curveballed me on me and went to a different model, and so I wasn't able to adapt my intuition quickly enough. Um, but my expectation within the, um, the empty Oreo model was that if you had an excipient bound, then they wouldn't be able to bind because they would need to clear out the excipients. And, and then that made it surprising to me that you were predicting protein binding that was too strong in that case. Because I would have thought that the empty Oreo model would give you the weakest uh, binding interaction. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a fair point. I, your point's well taken. It could go, the sign could go either way for sure on that. Um, but the, the experimental observation, let's just start there. The experimental observation is at excipient that weakens the protein-protein interface. So the implication with respect to how did we model this, and, you know, this Oreo model, how did we model this? What we're basically assuming is there's a little space in there in mm -hmm. that interface, even, even once that interface comes pretty close together. Where those binding sites are, it can handle the excipient without screwing up the binding to the other protein side. That's the assumption we make. And I think, you know, for this level of approximation, it seems to work okay. Okay. Um, and, and so the other question um, was about the, the nucleation behavior, the nucleation of the, the antibody complexes there. And yeah. I, I was wondering if you could comment a little bit on the mechanism of, of nuclear, because I wouldn't expect what you're illustrating there was these sort of elongated structures where the binding sites were far apart. And, you know, nucleation sort of at its heart is some sort of cooperative mechanism. And, and I, you know, that, you know, an in-body interaction is very different than a pairwise interaction. And I didn't see anything, in, at least in the cartoons, that looked at all cooperative. That looked like every binding site would be independent, especially you know in the case of an antibody where you've got these flexible linkers between each domain. Yeah. So the, this Lumry Iring theory is a little more coarse grained than that. Not having specifically, um, not specifically thinking about what where the cooperativity is and what it's coming from and so on. Essentially, all it is the, this Lumry Iring thing that 
it's a, it's a Chris Roberts uh, development. And what he all he shows is it's just a, I write down the differential equation. <laughs> all I do is I, I parse, I imagine the process has a nucleation and then a growth step. Now, you, as you say, you know, I can imagine a zillion alternatives here and I might be able to go in multiple directions. I might be able to do Chris Dobson like things and so on where I have breakage points and all that kind of fancy stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, what Chris does do, though, is he goes through several different models, but at the end of the day, he just boils it down to, I got nucleation, I got growth. Could I mm -hmm. distinguish those two in the world's simplest model? And the answer is it really depends on just that number that you see in the limit of higher concentration. If it if it converges to two, then nucleation is a good model. If it diverges from two, um, then growth is a good model. That's really, um, it's not super microscopic and granular, but that's, uh, but it does, you know, it's sufficient to fit the kinetic data. All right, thanks. Thanks, uh, Dave. Um, thanks, John. Uh, again, this is, uh, as usual, a very nice and beautiful talk, simple ideas in the beginning, and it gets a little bit more complicated. I have a philosophical question, which I don't even know I should be allowed to ask in this forum. But I was looking at your final presentation where you're combining, I think, the docking model in Stony Brook, the class W, I think is what you call it, MEL and MD simulations. So what I worry about is that if you were to look at experimental data on many of these multi-component systems, are we really forced in fact, I mean, I had to call you up maybe, or I had to collaborate with about five, six, seven people in order to get answers or, or is that, is, is, and how, how do, and in, in the process, you know, I wouldn't be comfortable knowing where the errors are because the different people did different things. So how, how do how do how should one do that in this ever increasing modern world of collaboration where even competition papers have over ten authors often? Um, <clears throat> can you crystallize that point a little bit more for me, Dave? I'm not clear what you're asking. I, I'm sort of worried that I can't do this problem mentally sitting in my office, um, developing you know, our own codes and algorithms and models. Because you use MEL, MD simulations, class W, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't know, yeah, yeah, I, I know. mean, I'm sure they're all perfect, but you know, I, uh, I need, so I don't know how one should think about these complex problems. Is it the only way one thinks about it? Should yeah, yeah. It? I, I, I take your point. And yes, you're right. You're not allowed to ask this. Uh, no, <laughs> sorry. Um, I, I think I I'm would not, say, but... <laughs> no, it's okay. Uh, no, I think it's a fair question. And right now, for example, for us, yes, we we distribute it. So the Slovenian group is the, those are the experts on the Wertheim theory. And uh, Dima Kostikov is the expert on Clus Pro. Fortunately, he's at the Laufer Center, so we just walk right across the, the hall, and he's and he runs that stuff. Uh, at the end of the day, what I really would like to do is have this look like something Steve Jobs built, right? You just have a box and a button that says on, and that's, and then you just push this button and it runs everything for you. And you never, you know, you never have to get into the guts of anything. Um, and so we would like to get it automated. We'd like to get it all hooked up in some general way, but where we are at the moment is just that the most basic proof of principle level, I would say, that we can see that if you do things in, in a certain way that you get right answers. And this is only on one system that we, at the very end, where we look at excipients and so on. It's only on one system. I haven't, I don't know. Uh, I assume it generalizes and I assume this sort of double stuff Oreo model is going to work okay for other ones too, but maybe not. Um, and maybe in heterogeneous uh, interfaces, two different proteins binding. I might have to do something fancier. So before we get to the stage of building a Steve Jobs machine, I think we got to get a lot more of this stuff worked out first. But your point's well taken. That's where we'd like to go with it. Thanks. Thank you 